Hello everyone, I am Vaishnav Achar from Texas Instruments. I would like to talk to you about today about tweaking device drivers for achieving real-time or deterministic performance in embedded systems using RT Linux. I work with the Texas Instruments Linux development team, primarily working on Linux and U-Boot for TI devices. I also maintain the TI platform since FR Artos as well. TI has a strong history of open source collaboration and we develop long-term sustainable products with focus on open source ecosystem in the device architecture phase itself. I have with me Vignesh. Vignesh is a software engineer at Texas Instruments India. He co-maintains the TI ARM64 SOC in mainland along with a few other device drivers as well. Also, Kirti, who is a significant part of the work, he is attending virtually and he is a software application engineer in Texas Instruments India. So this is the like overview of the talk. So RT Linux is being used more and more in embedded use cases, and customers and users expect MCU-like performance from RT Linux. And traditionally, uh, in use cases where an external MCU was used, those are getting re replaced by an application processor running RT Linux. So we'll just go through the first the what the problem we were facing on our DRA devices. We have multiple spy controllers, and using RT Linux. Uh, using SPI in the DMA mode with RT Linux enabled, we were seeing poor performance in the SPI target mode. SPI target mode is the mode where we are the receiving entity, or like we receive the clock and the chip select, and SPI host mode is the controller entity where we initiate the transaction. In the target mode, the RT Linux host does not con have control of when the transaction is getting in initiated, so we need hard real-time capabilities to uh, process all or not have any packet loss introduced. And we were seeing al also another issue in SPI host mode where we were continuously initiating transactions. We were seeing that we were seeing latency spikes. So almost all the nominal transactions took to 50 microseconds. But some transactions within a few minutes uh, takes goes to a 5 millisecond spike. So. This analysis, uh, we are trying to solve the problem and make, make generic suggestions on how someone can extend to their own solutions as well. So why do we care about these latencies? So now RT Linux is m more and more getting used by customers and use, uh, users in embedded use cases where ex a, a traditional MCU was getting used. And the expectation is like to have an MCU-like real-time performance so that they can have a real-time deterministic performance and also the versatility and the flexibility of provided by the high-level Linux OS. And this demand for the deterministic <laughs> performance is very high when we are ex interfacing with uh, external per uh, peripherals in an embedded system. And this demand is getting even higher when the external peripheral, we are, the RT Linux host is not the controlling entity for the external peripheral. The external peripheral starts the transaction and the host does not have control over when the transaction ha can happen. So we need hard real-time capabilities and uh, uh, with the common embedded buses like scan, spy, UART, or are the ones that request this deterministic performance. And of these, spy is the simplest one and the most popularly used one because of the simplicity and the low cost. So these are some use cases that we came up with uh, that were getting used with spy. So in industrial robotics, we saw in LIDARs be getting interfaced with spy. So in this case, the host processor running RT Linux is the controlling entity or that it, the one that initiates the transaction. So we have all control over how, when the transaction starts. But it, since it's a robotic application, the, uh, the system demands some deterministic capture of that sensor data, uh, which is very critical for the system functionality, like, like taking the LIDAR data and performing the motor control. Then we see use cases where the host processor emulates the a spy target on it. And uh, in these use, use cases, it is typically being used as spy is used, being used as a device management interface. So it's used like there will be an external supervisor which used to control the host uh, uh, running RT Linux. And it, it's getting used for different purposes, like firmware management, then also like an external watchdog doing a ping pong of the uh, RT Linux host. 
So we know that it's important to uh, look into these latencies in the in typical embedded systems running RT Linux. And so we will go through the steps that we went through to analyze uh, and reach our solution. So the first thing we would do uh, before uh, going into the device drivers or uh, analyzing an RT Linux latency issue is that ensure that your platform can run RT Linux and get your expectation correct. So first thing will, would be to get uh, your platform get working with the preempt RT kernel. The RT Linux wiki has all the details for it. So this was also discussed in multiple talks in RT Linux mini conference and ELC. So the first test that we run is the cyclic test. So this uh, test measures the thread's intended wake-up time and the actual time at which it wakes up. So this is how we get our expectations correct and we get our uh, overhead correct for our future budgeting in our RT stack. So this is the example command we ran in one of our TIK3 uh, platforms. Uh, okay. Yeah, this was before the actual next thing, but we wanted to keep it as it is so that it's not overlapping. And, and from Thomas' comment, it's actually fixed, right? So, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but apparently, if you go to the next slide, uh, the OSTL benchmarks are still running with the same command. <laughs> so, this is how, what we get when we plot these results. And so, you can see that the almost most of the threads wake up time is between 30 to 40 microseconds, but still there are some excursions to 70 to 80 microseconds. So from this plot, you will you get your expectations correct, and you, you can get an understanding of what your particular uh, platform performance can be when you run RT Linux. And RT Linux or the, the real time or the uh, performance or the, uh, is something like a system concept, and it's not, uh, we need to, ensure that the complete system is tuned or the perfect for the, this particular uh, workloads. So there is a tool called LMBench, which is used for DDR bandwidth and latency analysis. And it, uh, it's uh, used for uh, identifying any bottlenecks in the hardware. So all these tools have been discussed in their own particular talks. I am just going through uh, what generic steps, what you can do to uh, ensure that yeah, RT Linux uh, runs uh, on your system and what expectations you can have. Then there is RTLA timer LAT. It's a front end to the timer LAT tracer and it helps you identify the scheduling latency in your system. And once you have all the uh, benchmarking and all done and you'll have, you have your expectation correct, then next thing you would need to check is your configurations. Let's say you have some extensive power management configuration on your RT Linux system, then you, it will hinder your RT performance so, or extensive debug uh, configs. So that would be the first thing to check, then the real-time policies, then you, ha you have multiple tuning knobs that you can have uh, as part of RT Linux, then you can, even the application process, you can bump up the uh, real-time priority, and all these are, details are available in the RT Linux wiki as well. So in our case, we fundamentally had issue with our device drivers. But if, in, 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 if you have some issue with the device drivers, even if you have all these tweaking knobs, if you have a weak path or a slow path in your device drivers, even if you tweak everything using all these uh, options available, you might not be able to get the best performance. So and it. it becomes more complex when you have more than one subsystem interacting, like you, you have this Pi in DMA mode, where you have this Pi core subsystem, then you have this Pi device driver, then you have the DMA engine subsystem and the DMA controller driver. And also, in this case, we were using user space to trigger these Pi transactions using the Pi dev driver, then user space application also plays the role. So the, this debug becomes a little bit complex when uh, you, you'll need to have an overall picture to understand where exactly the latency is. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of what is Pi. Almost everyone would know it. It's a simple uh, embedded interface, synchronous interface. Where you have the clock, then you have the data lines, and there is a chip select. So Spy can operate in host and target mode. Host is the entity that 
triggers the chip select and starts the transaction, or, and it's also the same that uh, provides the uh, synchronous clock. In Linux kernel, we there was historically there was support for uh, spy host mode or the controller mode, and uh, the in v forward the thing the spy target mode support was added and six uh, uh, spy controller support target mode as well. So why do we take or discuss this spy target mode in particular? So because if you take UART or I2C, it has its own flow control mechanism. So UART has the uh, ready to send or clear uh, send uh, flow control signals, which helps to introduce a flow control between the sending entity and the receiving entity. We have something like that in I2C as well, but for a spy target, host, host to target, there is nothing, there's no standard flow control mechanism as well. And the next, issue is that the transfer is full duplex, so the Rx and Tx packets are sent at the same time, and if in Linux, if you are running on the spy target mode, you cannot have the uh, response for that the incoming packet in the same packet itself, because Rx and Tx, it happens in the same packets, you will not need to have more than one transfer to have, have the uh, proper response to the sending entity. So these are some challenges with uh, spy, spy target mode in Linux. So we are, uh, I, told you, I told you earlier that we faced the latency issues. The first thing that we did when we faced the latency issues was to analyze what's this, uh, happening in the spy subsystem. So is, are there any work queues or tasklets in this spy subsystem, core subsystem that can affect our performance. So what happens in the spy subsystem is that we have the spy uh, client driver that pushes the spy trans uh, transaction messages to the spy message queue. This is the controller specific work queue. And then it goes to the spy controller driver. The spy controller driver performs the setup, then initiates things like the DMS setup, and waits for the completion of events. In the CPO mode, it could be the interrupts, then in DMA mode, we will be waiting for the DMA completion as well. So then we went in to look at the, what actually happens when you perform a spy transaction with DMA. So when the user space initiates the transaction using its spy driver, so we call the spy IO, message IOctel, then it goes to the spy core subsystem, then it goes to the controller, it performs the setup, then it queues the DMA operations to the, uh, it sets up the DMA, then the, uh, the DMA engine configuration is called, then the specific DMA controller driver is being set up, and this transaction is queued in the DMA engine controller's queue. And on the hardware, we perform the setup, and the transaction happens. So this is what happens during a spy transaction with DMA enabled when triggered from user space. So earlier we saw that like we saw a large latency, so we uh, captured the trace using trace CMD and analyzed using, it using kernel shark. So we saw that the Rx happened within 800 microseconds, and the Tx, it took 850 milliseconds, which was very large. And if you look at it, it was a full duplex transfer. The Rx and Tx actually happened in the hardware at the same time but we got to know it 850 milliseconds. So this is one of the worst case capture we had, like some 100 milliseconds as well, but compared to what the transaction size was and the clock speed was, this was way off our expectations. So then we found that the delay, the most of the delay is getting introduced by the DMA controller driver. Initially, we did not have a suspect of the DMA controller driver we, because we were just queuing the DMA requests and waiting for the DMA completion in the spy driver. Looking at the spy driver, we could not find this issue, but looking at the traces, we can see that the most of the time is getting taken with the DMA check TX completion. And our max, the spy driver is waiting for that completion as well. So then we found another option. So we uh, discussed that the spy core has already has a message queue for the each controller, and there was a way to bump up the priority for this message queue. Um, 
to make that the message queue uh, work queue real time priority but in in our case the delay was already introduced only by the dma driver but i am just discussing this in case someone wants to so we we can look at subsystem level uh, uh tweaking option to change the work queue priorities and all so then we analyzed our spy controller driver so then we found that in looking at the spy controller driver the issue is not very evident because we are just queuing the dma request and waiting for the completion at the spy driver then we had a look at the dma engine and the dma driver so we saw that this the typical uh, operations that happens we submit the dma request then it goes to an async issue pending queue then we wait for the completion and once the completion happens we call the callback from the requesting entity in this case the spy controller driver so there is a very two level deferred work queue setup in this dm engine driver uh, that we found out and the in the so we saw that it the most of the delay was there in the udma udma tx completion what happened was that in all our socs we had something like a network on chip architecture where there are multiple dma controllers so there is a central dma controller and there is a, there are small dma controllers near to these peripherals so what happened in this a deferred task like was that the we were uh, checking the status of these peripheral dma controllers and checking whether the complete transaction ensure the pipe is flush before uh, uh, marking the operation as complete so all the issues in our case was caused by this tasklet or deferred work queues and you know, in a generic case we were having a non rt um, uh, uh, code path in in where we expected uh, an rd performance so just to add the uh, the the, the way the DMA uh, works is that once the DMA uh, transaction is done, there is a task list that gets scheduled, which then informs the uh, the client that submitted the DMA request that uh, the transfer is done and does a call back to that. So, so that's one level of uh, task list, and it is per channel, and it is it, it depends on number of channels that are in use, and and you know it's kind of a shared. Uh, there are multiple threads, you, as you can imagine, and they are all competing for the same uh, set of resource in the system, right? So, uh, I mean, the scheduling uh, time, that is, right? So, uh, to add to that, the, uh, as I described in the, uh, we have described in the second half, uh, the, the architecture that we were working on had an ad additional layer, uh, wherein we had to monitor uh, multiple uh, DMA endpoints to be able to uh, successfully say that the transaction is done. Uh, which is a combination of IRQ and a threaded IRQ uh, bottom handler. So, so basically, we had at least three threads in the system. One is a spy um, message queue, which is where the data is coming into the driver. There is a, a queue through which the submission is being uh, reported back to the driver, and a queue within the DMA driver itself that's that's also uh, uh, playing the role. So there are at least three or four threads that are competing here to to get the things done within a given amount of budget that we have. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so these are all the three uh, places that indicated the latency graphs like Vignesh mentioned. So what we did was just tune the priorities, make all these pipe uh, controller uh, uh, pump messages the work queue as real-time priority, then make the DMA task let as real-time and higher priority, and also convert the work queue within DMA driver to real time priority so e, e, like even though this reduced the jitter and brings in a slight level of determinism but we still had these deferred tasklets and uh, all the non rt code in the R, real time rt path where we are ex expecting real time performance so uh, the best thing to do would be to eliminate these non rt paths and eliminate these deferred tasklets in your code so this is what we did to make the DMA driver work queue uh, real time. Then we saw how we made the spy controller work queue also real time. The spy subsystem already provides an option for that. So then we uh, discussed with the hardware engineers and uh, found out a way that our spy controller already has a way to uh, provide an event that 
gives us a local understanding of the completion. So we can use that to eliminate all these deferred tasklets and completion in the um, real time path. So earlier we were relying on the DMA, all this, um, we were checking up on the small DM, peripheral DMA controllers and getting the understanding of the completion. But now the, we are programming like the spy controller to provide an event upon uh, shifting out or shifting in a given number of uh, words. So in this case, we have all these fixed size, it, this works for all fixed size packets, and this was the case of we, of when we use spy target mode always. And uh, so this is how what happened. So in, in our new flow earlier, we were setting up this spy, spy controller, then queuing the DMA transaction, then we were waiting for the DMA completion. But if you look at the DMA system, we have the data in the memory, then the DMA controller takes it to the spy controller, and spy controller shifts it out. And if you look at it, so if the spy controller could shift it out, then we already know the data has already reached the spy controller. So we, if the spy controller could shift the data out and provide an event, then it is already understood the DMA transaction is already complete. So in general, what we need to look for is if there are ta different tasklets, we need to somehow make, may, first thing would be to eliminate that task or, or bump up the priority for those. You want to add something? Uh, sorry, so just to add to that, uh, the point here is that we are trying to eliminate the amount of work that is done uh, in a, you know, no, in a real time path. So uh, defer all the works to be background tasks. The general way the driver is written may not always be the best choice when you're working with an RT kernel. So the general way of writing a driver is you would you know, wait for a signal from a, a subsystem to which you have asked for a submitted a request for you to I indicate that it is done. Uh, but because of the nature of how the Linux driver subsystems are, how we are interacting across the subsystem, there may be quite a bit of latency by the time you do get back that response, right? So. The idea is that you know when you are writing a uh, RT path and we are creating an RT path, you should kind of try and you know keep it as minimum as possible so that you can achieve much more uh, determinism in the path. So th that's the point that we are trying to bring out here that we had to kind of rewrite the spy driver that we had uh, to to look at the uh, signals, to look at the indications that are available from the hardware at that point in time to you know kind of uh, get the indication of that, whether we are ready to take up the next request or start servicing the ne next request without you know, always waiting for the round trip from the DMA subsystem for us to indicate the same. And you could always ask that we could entirely eliminate the other subsystems, such as DMA, for example, here. But that has its own challenges. Uh, for example, with a spy target mode kind of a use case, uh, the CPU just can't be quick enough to put data at the rate uh, that that the you know the spy controller needs it, uh, you may have to you know buffer it up bef beforehand, right? So that that that's one thing, and the CPU itself is also uh, working with other uh, user space applications to get the processing done and get the data out as well, right? So so basically, the the interdependencies would still be there, and you kind of really have to make sure that the path is as small as possible at this point. Yeah, with all the new changes, like we, when we re, re, had rewritten the spy driver to use its own event and not rely on the DMA uh, callback, so we had we saw significant changes in the performance and where we saw kind of 850 millisecond delay, which is very poor. We were kind of seeing some more realistic numbers, kind of 800 microsecond for per transaction, which was what very well within our expectations. So. And in RT Linux cases, we can bound this latency to uh, what our expectations is. But in, to increase the robustness of the system, we discussed earlier that the, there will be an external entity that's sending the messages to the RT Linux host, and there is no standard flow control mechanism. So we, uh, some, we use a simple GPIO-based ready signaling so that the target can signal to the host that it, it's ready to uh, receive the message. So be, when we are using the controller in target mode, we need to have the message already queued because once the chip select is toggled by the host, we 
need to, and once the clock is here, we need to start pushing the data uh, through this by uh, lines. So, like we use something like a ready signaling from the client uh, or the target to signal that it's ready to, and it's ready when it's queued the transaction. This uh, is a, like increased robustness in an RT system, and also it makes this Pi target use case or, or more realistically possible in non-RT systems as well. So once we check the traces after making these changes, now we are not relying on the uh, DMA controller interrupt. Now we saw that the completion was happening within 800 microsecond, which was our realistic values. And we saw that earlier that the RX was ha already happening at 800 microsecond, but only in the TX path, we were, we were understanding that it completed after a long time due to those deferred tasklets. So this is what we changed. We, we uh, eliminated the UDMA, the, the checked completion path, and on the DMA engine, we made some changes. So usually, on all the DMA transactions, we, when, when we perf perform the DMA transaction setup, we were, we are, we'll always be requesting for a callback by default. So we made a, a change to not request a callback and rely on a local understanding or the controller level understanding in this uh, use case. So this is what we saw earlier. After making this change, we saw that like in, in host mode, I did not speak much about host mode here because like as part of making this change for target mode or relying on the cell, the interrupt, uh, the controller interrupt, we could see that the, the, the latency spikes that happened due to the deferred tasklets, that, uh, the root cause for that was also the deferred tasklets. That also went away and we saw uh, peak latency staying less than 400 microsecond, which is realistic for the robotics control use case. So I just wanted to, so from our learnings, we the, uh, what the first thing to do for your, any particular system would be to first uh, like get the system, we can we ensure that the system can wor work RT workloads and also get your budgeting and your expectations correct on what delays you can expect from the scheduler uh, and all, and also keep the IRQ of state to a minimum. And also in our case, we had the RT task, that's the spike transaction, Waiting, for low, waiting on low priority work queues on the DMA controller side. That was the root cause of all our problems. So we should uh, eliminate th those kind of si situations. And yes, multiple level work queues always kills the deterministic performance. And we should try to rely on the hardware state uh, as much as possible to make the software complex or make the RT path very simple. So if that kind of... Uh, Hardware features are not available. We should communicate that to the hardware designers as well. So these are references we use. So we also did some testing with the, usually despite how we do testing is, we do a loop back of the MOSI MISO signals and perform the testing at the host. We don't perform a host target loop back kind of testing. So we, I have a GitHub where we mentioned how we captured the traces and lays, then how we tested this in our system as well. Okay, thank you. We are open for questions. Uh, you said at the beginning that uh, this SPI controller might be used without the DMA, right? Yes, this can be used without the DMA. So, but uh, you will be going up with the CPU usage a bit, and that was something some of our customers was not very happy with. So they want to not for this, this particular use cases they wanted to use it with DMA, and as Vignesh Saler mentioned in the target mode, we cannot use it with DMA because. We need to be already be ready with the uh, the what we need to push through this five shift register, and CPU cannot be that fast to do that. CPU already already also has to do other tasks as well. So two things in in host mode we can always use CPU, but customers prefer to offload it, uh, and keep the CPU usage very low 
and offload things to DMA. Okay, thank. that, that uh, thanks. That was my second question. <laughs> okay. Okay, I hope there are no other questions. Thank you everyone for your time. Yeah, please speak to Richard on the line.